Hello my beautiful friends, welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, my name is Cami, and what I like to do here on YouTube is I like to talk about cases that either no other YouTubers have talked about or that have not been talked about very much, and that is exactly what we are going to be doing today. So if y'all have been here for quite a while, you know that normally I like to go all in on people who hurt children, abuse them, kill them, etc. And at first glance, that's kind of what this looks like today where someone just hurts a child, kills a child with no reason for it. But the deeper we get into the case, we uncover things that make the actions make sense. Just bear with me, okay? Don't don't come for me in the comments. You'll understand what I mean as we get into the video. So I'm gonna stop talking and I'm gonna get right into it. But before I get in, I want to give a trigger warning because there is going to be discussions of sexual abuse animal abuse, murder, and several other things. So if you can't handle that, I understand. I have other videos that you can click on. I don't recommend watching this one. On New Year's Eve of 1975, the fire department in Greenwood, Indiana was called to the home at 25 Sayer Drive that was being quickly engulfed in flames. As the firefighters arrived on the scene, they witnessed a young girl who was only 18 and her name was Sarah Isabel, AKA Cindy White, she was fleeing from the rear of the house. She was hysterical, she was screaming. They had to restrain her so that way she couldn't re-enter the home, so that way she wouldn't get stuck and die in the flames. This home at 25 Sayer Drive belonged to the Roberson family. Roberson? Roberson? I'm from the South, I say Roberson. And this family included the parents, Charles and Carol, and their children, Michael, Dale, Gary, and Rita. Unfortunately, every single one of these family members died from smoke inhalation and from carbon monoxide poisoning. And Sarah was actually the live-in babysitter and the only survivor of the fire. However, she did not escape scot-free. She did end up with a small burn on her arm. And fortunately, or unfortunately, fortunately because it wasn't a slow death, Every single one of the family members ended up dying within minutes of when this fire started. So initially Sarah had said that she awoke from her bed, which was actually the living room couch. She didn't have an actual bed. She saw this fire engulfing the wall near the Christmas tree and that she shot up from where she was sleeping. She ran to try and warn the family of the fire. According to Sarah, she tried to get the children out but because of how thick the smoke was, she actually ended up losing her contact with them. So she had her hand grabbing their hand, but because of how thick the smoke was from this fire, she ended up losing contact with them. But Sarah says that she thought that as she was moving to this, oh, this window in one of the rear bedrooms, that the children and the rest of the family would be right behind her. But she quickly realized after she got out that that was not the case. So initially they thought that this fire was accidental, but upon further inspection, they found that it had been deliberately set. So the Christmas tree that they had was a flame-proof kind and the Christmas tree would actually melt before it could ever ignite. So there's no way that the Christmas tree could have been the source of the fire. And after they found that, they checked the wiring, the appliances, the gas lines, and the furnace, and they found that the fire had actually damaged each system, not the other way around. They found burn patterns in the home that indicated that gasoline had been used as an accelerant, that the heat had been turned all the way up to try and progress this fire. The pajamas that Sarah had worn had been the highly flammable kind, but they hadn't caught on fire and she was in the room where this fire had started. So if anything was gonna catch on fire, it was going to be Sarah's pajama pants. The person that set this fire was Sarah herself. You have to ask yourself, what would drive a young woman to kill an entire family comprised mostly of children? To understand that, we have to take a look at who Sarah was and who the Roberson family was and what led up to the events of New Year's Eve in 1975. So I couldn't find an exact like birth date for Sarah, but she was born around 1957 in Indiana and she had five siblings. Her mother was an alcoholic and so she kind of turned to her father for attention because she really wanted to be like his favorite kid, but her father, she was her father's favorite in a different kind of way. When Sarah was around eight, her father began to sexually abuse her and over the years it just got worse. 
And when this young girl finally got enough courage to tell her mother, instead of her mother divorcing him and comforting her child or turning him into the police, she just told Sarah that she shouldn't be in the same room as him. This is really a great woman to be having kids. So in 1971, when Sarah was around 14, her father actually ended up dying. So she ended up getting away from the abuse at her father's hand. But at that point, it didn't matter. She was already traumatized from the abuse she endured. I mean, it started when she was eight years old and she was 14 now. And she it was, it was prolonged abuse. So she had some trauma going on. And because of this trauma, when Cindy was a teenager, she was actually admitted into a mental hospital for involuntary paralysis that stemmed from her abuse. While she was in the hospital, her mother actually died as well. After she was released, she got a job as a live-in babysitter with the Roberson. So Cindy had actually met the Robersons while she was a paper delivery person. And you know, like she would go around on her bike and she would like throw the papers onto the doorsteps, all that kind of thing. And she also used to play with their kids. So she delivered paper to the house and her, the kids ended up loving her. So she would often play with their children. So they offer her this job as a live-in like nanny slash babysitter. And Cindy is excited. She's like, yes, for sure. I'll definitely be like your live-in nanny. You know, what do you need me to do? Do you need me to bring them places? Do you want me to play with them? I'll do what you need me to do. And she's like, I'll make a little bit of money maybe, and I'll have a place to live. I don't have to worry about finding some place to go. I don't have to be like in the system or anything. And like I said, she was just very excited, but sadly she quickly learned that not everything was as it seemed. Charles, which is the father of this family. The parents are Charles and Carol. Carol's the mother. Charles quickly began flirting with Cindy. And at first Cindy was kind of flattered. You know, this older man is paying attention to her. She said when it first happened, she was very giddy. She was very excited. And even though she did see him as a father figure, she kind of welcomed the flirting, but it wasn't very long until his behavior got much more disturbing according to Cindy. But I mean, that's already kind of disturbing. A grown ass man flirting with a teenager. <laughs> Charles would sit Cindy down and he would make her watch certain types of movies. I don't want to say it because YouTube likes to suppress anything that mentioning that, but you kind of adult movies. He would make her watch adult movies and engage in relations with him in front of other men. So at this point, you're probably thinking, well, why didn't she tell Carol? You know, Carol might do something, but let me tell you, it's because Carol was also involved in the sexual abuse. This poor girl, you know, she's been sexually abused by her father. Her mother dies while she's in this mental hospital because of the trauma that she endured from her father. When she told her mother about the abuse from her father, her mother just tells her, you know, don't be in the same room with him. She doesn't actually help Cindy. And when she's finally out of this hospital, she thinks that she has like a safe place to go. But instead, she's just going right back into the same kind of abuse that she suffered from her father. Cindy actually learned that Carol was complicit in it when she walked in on Charles and Cindy and didn't stop it and didn't even really react to it. Like she just kind of like looked in the bedroom or the room that it was happening in. I guess she just kind of like shrugged and walked away. <sighs> I hate these people. Charles also made her participate in certain types of abuse against animals. This guy was just the worst. I hate this man. I'm gonna give another trigger warning right now for animal abuse. At one point, Cindy was finally, she finally had the courage. She was like, okay, I'm gonna leave. I don't care where I go. I don't care if I'm homeless. I'm, I'm just gonna leave. But when she tried to leave, Charles locked her in a bedroom, came back a little while later with a kitten and killed it right in front of her and told her that if she tried to leave or she didn't obey, that that's what was going to happen to her. So she quickly figures out that she's going to have to get out another way. So she gets the idea to start this fire and she didn't realize that this fire was going to accelerate very quickly as fires tend to do, and it got out of hand. And once she realized that this fire was getting to the point that it was no longer going to be something that was going to make the firefighters come and put it out, once she realized it wasn't like gonna be a small fire, 
that's when she decided, you know, she has to go and get the rest of the family, that she needed to wake them up, that they needed to get out of the house. So I'm gonna jump around a little bit, okay? So just try and bear with me. So for now, we're going to jump into the trial. At trial, Cindy actually asked for the photographs of the bodies to be suppressed because they would be inflammatory and prejudicial to the jury. And at this point in the trial, they had suppressed like a ton of photos. They kept one photo of each victim's bodies to show how they were found after the fire. So they suppressed all these photos, but kept photos of the victims. So that's why Sarah kind of said, you know, if you show these, it's going to be inflammatory and prejudicial and could influence an emotional reaction from the jury. Now they actually had the coroner testify how each victim was found after the fire. And especially when it came to Charles, he testified that it was the most charred out of all of the victim's bodies, which, I don't know, that kind of makes me happy that he got it the worst. <laughs> that's probably, that's probably mean, but I don't care. I don't like this man. I think he's horrible and I think he deserved what he got. The coroner also testified that the degree of the burns on the corpses corresponded with the arson investigators findings regarding the rooms in which they had been found. So because of this, the jury decided that the photos were not only relevant, they could prove or disprove one major fact. Could the defendant have been found asleep on the living room couch, the living room where the fire started, and have reasonably escaped injury. So basically they said that this could prove or disprove whether or not she had started the fire and whether she could have escaped without injury. Because of this, they decided that they were going to keep the photographs in. And this has actually been a big point of Sarah's appeal. Should the photographs have been suppressed as Sarah wanted? Another big thing mentioned in this case is that they apparently included results of a polygraph test, which y'all know my feelings on polygraph tests. They're not, they're not reliable. And for the most part, they're not even admissible in court because they are so unreliable. So Sarah claims that the court should not have allowed the state to include testimony regarding the results of the polygraph. When she took the polygraph test, she had agreed that the results of it could be used if they ask her a question and she says something different to what her polygraph proved. So like, for example, if I, if you ask me in a polygraph test, are you wearing a brown wig? And I said, yes and you asked me in court later, were you wearing a brown wig? And I said, no, then they could be like, well, that's not what the polygraph test said. Make sense? I'm trying to, I'm trying to make this as easily as understandable as possible. Sarah says that she admits that she put the stipulation prior to taking the test that they could be used as evidence in trial, but that they should only have been used in rebuttal. So the example like I gave. Sarah says that other cases have done exactly what she had agreed to. And also in Indiana, polygraph tests are inadmissible in court. However, according to court documents, after reviewing this waiver that Sarah supposedly had signed, it was determined that Sarah did allow the presentation of the polygraphs to be used in trial. And this waiver says that she waived her right to objection to its admission, which is why the trial court allowed it, which like, maybe I don't understand the legal system enough yet, but it just feels like if something is inadmissible in court that they wouldn't use it regardless of if a waiver was signed or not. And supposedly, the trial court did tell the jury to keep in mind that a polygraph test is not considered more than 80% accurate and that a polygraph examiner's testimony does not prove or disprove any element of the crime with which the defendant is charged. They also said that it's the function of the jury to determine what corroborative weight and effect the testimony should be given in regards to the polygraph test. Now, it's not more than 80% correct. I don't know about y'all, but like, could you imagine going to the doctor and them being like, I'm 80% sure you're going to live past age 30, but there's a 20% chance I could be wrong. It just seems weird to me that they would allow this polygraph to be used when it's not admissible in court. Everyone knows, everyone that keeps up with true crime knows that polygraphs are not, <laughs> they're not accurate. So Sarah was convicted of arson and six counts of felony murder, which is murder committed while committing a felony. She was sentenced to Indiana Women's Prison for no less than five years and no more than 20 years for arson. 
and for and during life for the murders. So basically this woman is never getting out of prison. Since Sarah was convicted of felony murder, her attorney really focused on the arson charge. She argued that the state failed to prove that it was arson beyond a reasonable doubt and that direct evidence is needed to establish guilty in a felony arson murder. She cited these Indiana codes, which I'm going to read for you right now. Indiana code 351611 Burns 1975 provides that any person who willfully and maliciously sets fire to or burns or causes the setting of the fire to or the burning of any dwelling house, such being the property of another, shall be guilty of arson in the first degree. So basically if you set fire to someone's home, you're guilty of arson in the first degree, which I didn't know they had different degrees for stuff like arson. I mean, I guess that makes sense. Indiana Code 351617 Burns 1975 adds that, should the life of any person or persons be lost by reason of or because of the violation of any of the provisions of any of the foregoing sections of this act, the person or persons guilty of such violation shall be deemed guilty of murder in the first degree. So the defense attorney is basically arguing that there was no proof that Sarah had started the fire, which realistically there's not. They, they just have circumstantial evidence. What they determined was that the fire had started in the living room, that Sarah was in the living room when the fire had started, that it was started on purpose and that an accelerant had been used to start the fire, that Sarah had shown an interest in fires before the fire had started, which we're gonna get to in a minute. They also said that even though everyone else in the fire had died, Sarah only had a minor injury, which doesn't make sense considering she was in the room where the fire had started. They also said that there's no way that Sarah's account of the fire was possible and that Sarah had access to two different types of accelerant. Now let's talk about this whole Sarah was interested in fires for a few minutes. So the night of the fire, Sarah had made a call to her sister-in-law because her grandmother's house had caught fire that night. Sarah had made a call to her sister-in-law because her grandmother's house had actually caught fire. So she was calling to make sure that everyone was okay but she also asked how it started, if her siblings had to get new clothes due to the fire. And apparently she was just really interested in this fire because in her mind, like I said earlier in the video, she thought if she started a small fire, the police would be called and she could finally get away from these monsters that she was living with. And if she burned the house down, she could go with someone else or even just live on her own. The facts that I had mentioned just a moment ago were what the jury said was sufficient enough to decide that Sarah had started the fire, even though there was no like concrete proof that she had started it. It's all just circumstantial. Because they determined that she had been responsible for this fire, that also means that anyone who had died as a result of this fire, she was directly responsible for their deaths. Throughout this trial, they really just painted Sarah out to be this jilted lover who wanted revenge on Charles and Carol. But that absolutely was not the case. And even in legal documents that you look at now, they still paint her out to be this way. The prosecutors used nude photographs of Sarah found in Charles's wallet as well as a love letter written to her to try and paint her out to be this just awful person when that wasn't the case. They also did not allow, the trial also did not allow allegations that Sarah had been abused by her father or by Charles and Carol at trial. And the reason that they were not allowed to use this is because Sarah has since said that she was too embarrassed to admit it, which isn't, it's not uncommon for abuse victims to be too embarrassed to admit what was happening. And Candace DeLong, which I've mentioned her in my videos, she was on Deadly Women. I don't know if she's still on there. I haven't watched it in a few seasons, but she's like a former FBI profiler. She actually did an interview with her and it, it's hard to watch, man. It, if I can find a link to it, cause I don't know if it's still on YouTube. If I can find a link to it or if I can find an article that talks about it, I'll leave it linked in the description down below. And Sarah said that she did not want anyone to die that night. And if she could say anything to the kids now, she'd say that she's sorry that she didn't protect them. So this, this poor girl, she, it was not her intention to kill anyone. She didn't want anyone to die. She didn't even want Charles and Carol to die. 
She just wanted to get out of the house. Since this case, they've tried to appeal Sarah's case multiple times but it's been denied every single time. A 1999 ruling also determined that she could not be released on parole because inmates serving life at the time of her conviction weren't eligible for parole. So eventually they started going for clemency hearings. Sarah loved these kids like they were her own. She has said, like, like I said, she said she never wanted anyone to die, but especially not the kids who Sarah genuinely loved like her own children. Like, like I said, she'd played with these kids before. She took care of them. Sarah has been in prison longer than any other female inmate in Indiana and spends most of her time in a wheelchair due to having two strokes. And that is the very sad story of Sarah Cindy White. Here's my opinion. I don't think this woman needs prison. The United States prison system is not about rehabilitation. It's about punishment, which is exactly what they're doing to this woman. I think Sarah needs to be in a mental health facility. She has said on more than one occasion that, like I said, that she didn't want anyone to die. She just wanted to escape when she couldn't because this man has told her that he's going to kill her if she didn't listen to him and if she tried to leave. I think... I think she needed some kind of punishment because she did end up killing people. But I don't think it needs to be prison. She should have been put in a mental health facility. They should factor in now that there wasn't evidence presented at the original trial that could have explained why she did what she did. Because none of, none of Sarah's background was presented at trial because she was too embarrassed to admit what had happened to her. So I would think that now that she's talking about it, that they would take that into account with her parole hearing. I don't know, man. It's just a sad situation. Let me know what y'all think. And I will see you all in my next one. Bye.